This is a video for people considering applying for the Royal Society of Edinburgh Enterprise Fellowship Programme. My name is Dr. Kevin Parker, and my company is called KKI Associates. Together with my colleague, Dr. Tony Alders, we have been operating in the area of startups, spin out companies for approximately 25 years, and we've probably carried out something like 500 assignments over that time. In particular, we've been working with the Royal Society of Edinburgh for the last eight or nine years, doing application workshops to help people produce better applications for the Royal Society of Edinburgh Enterprise Fellowship Scheme. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tony Aldous. I'm an associate of Kevin's. I've been working with him for about 25 years now, and we've covered a whole range of different technology projects across a whole different range of uh, and industries over that time. So we're pretty confident that we've seen most of the questions that you'll be wanting to address in putting your application together for the RSE. Uh, this one is called Finding and Raising Money. It's delivered by myself, Kevin Parker, and my colleague, Dr. Tony Albers. <clears throat> These days, the Enterprise Fellowship Scheme has an application form which is online. It's uh, on that online form, you'll find a number of sections. Administration section A, which we're not gonna talk about, and questions on administration should be directed uh, to the RSE itself. Uh, people issues, mostly in uh, section B. Market and technology issues, mostly in section C. Intellectual property issues, section D. Funding issues, the subject of this video in section E. I'm going to hand over to Tony now to talk um, through some of the main points from his perspective of funding and raising money. Thanks very much, Kevin. Let's look at the first slide. This uh, comes from the Wales Council of Voluntary Action, and it really is quite a good summary of the questions that any funder is going to ask you. Uh, the sequence that they're asked uh, varies depending on the funder that you're looking at, but it really does cover all of the questions that, you know, that a funder is going to want to know, whatever the context. So it could be a business context, it could be a grant application, or indeed in this case, it could be someone who's running a charity. Now, if we look at what the RSE are asking you about, they've been asking you a number of questions. How has progress been funded to date? Where are you seeking funding at present? Where else are you looking, that is? If you get an RSE fellowship, will you need further funding in the future and where will it come from? But first is a really quite important question. What do you hope to achieve during this award? Now, this is really just to check a place where we can check that you're in the right presentation and that you're looking at the right scheme. Because this is one of the few questions where we're going to point you towards the, what we believe to be the correct answer. The objective of the work that you're going to be doing over the next year with the RSE fellowship is to develop a business plan to take your technology to market. And it may well be that you'll need to, do, to obtain some startup funding to get the business going. So what you may well need to do is develop a pitch to potential investors to raise investment to get the business started. So that's what the fund is for. So conversely, I can tell you what the RSE Fellowship is not for, and it's not funding for researching the science or developing the technology. So be very clear, this is definitely a business oriented fellowship. It's not about technology development. If that's what you're interested in, this is not the presentation for you and it's not the scheme you're looking for. So here we are. We're gonna jump ahead a bit now. You've been doing the fellowship for a few months and you're now wanting to look at grow, obtaining some money to start and grow your business. Now, there's plenty of money around in what's called non-diluting funds. Now, what we mean by diluting is that you're ha having to sell equity in your business. But if you can get a grant or win a business plan competition, usually that's just money with no very strong strings attached to it. You're certainly not being required to sell equity in your business. However, if you're going to have a high growth business or something with big startup <laughs> costs, you may well have to sell shares, that is, part of the business equity at startup. Now this may well be to wealthy individuals or family or friends or business angels as they're known. 
business angels typically are business people who have run a business previously, taken their investment out, and they're wealthy now and they're looking to invest in younger businesses. Usually people investing in your business are going to want to discuss an exit fairly early on in the process, process. That is, they're going to say, well, I'm going to put some money into this business, but how do I get it back? Usually getting a dividend, that is a small percentage back, isn't sufficient. What they're interested in is an exit. That is, at some point, are you going to sell the whole business so that I can get all of my money back, plus a substantial financial return, so they can go around the whole loop again? So be very clear that very early on, people are going to be wanting to talk about, and it's very strange this, how to get out of the business even before they put the money into it. Now, I've got some very rough guidance here on where you might sell equity. Now, the boundaries here are very fluid because it depends on who you know. So you may well have family and friends who are happy to put in more than £20,000 into your business. Business angels, there's a very wide range I've given here. Um, you might find individual private investors, or you might find angel investor clubs, and they may well put somewhere between, and it could be seed money from, say, 10,000 up to or typically around half a million. If you're looking for even more substantial money than that, then it's not going to be worth a venture capitalist looking at investing less than something around a million pound mark. So many businesses start off with informal investments, and then as they grow, they find a need to move across to venture capitalists to come in with a really serious money to get the business growing really quickly. Pricing. This is a very contentious question. I always advise people to try and avoid the question of pricing the business. It's not one of those things you want to get into early. You're best to focus on how much money you need to raise to get the business running. Now, what's the reason for that? It's because the people that you're asking to invest are really focusing on you and what you're going to do with the money. So tell them why you need the money and then leave the valuation of the business for a later date. You don't want to raise this as a contentious issue too early in a relationship. And I'd have to say the other thing is many of the valuations that I have seen have been way out of bounds and they're always far too high on the part of the person who's starting the business. And if you're really looking to upset a potential investor, it's to suggest that your startup business is worth 200 million pounds when you haven't made a single sale. It's just not going to happen. Now, the reason this matters is because one of the things you're going to be learning to do through the RSE process is how to pitch. And your first pitch is going to be to the RSE panel. And again, what you're going to be doing is pitching for the amount of money that you need for the year, which is already predetermined but you're not going to be speaking about the value of your business potentially. You're just wanting to make a pitch to the panel that says, look, I'm here, I've got a great idea, and I want to move this business idea along over the next year. Having said company valuation is a contentious issue, I'm just going to throw this in to give you some idea of where you might be pitching somewhere around a year's time. And my view is a new start technology-based business with secure IP, a formative management team, that is, you may be waiting for the money to come in before you can recruit people in, and an attractive market might be valued at around a half million pounds by potential investors at startup. And this is really just me pitching in a rough idea of where you might value your business so that you know where you might be. So if you're asking for people to put money in on a valuation of 10 million, they're really going to want to understand why you've come up with such a large figure for your initial valuation. If you are pitching to investors and to wealthy individuals, the reason they're doing it, let's be very clear, is to make money. And I've, I've put uh, in brackets, hopefully, because we already know that most investments won't indeed make money. They'll just be an unfortunate uh, experience for the investors. So conversations will typically focus around money, profitability, financial returns, and of course, the crucial question of how to get the original money back out of the business at a later date. That is, how will the exit happen? Will it be a trade sale? Or will the business potentially go on to a stock market, one of the junior markets, most likely? 
So there's a lot of talk about money. And the reason is because the investor is investing to make money. It's not because they love your technology. So be very clear on that. So what do investors know? Well, they know that only one in 10 investments will result in a significant financial return. And most investments won't yield a return. But more importantly, many of those businesses that don't yield a great return are going to limp along. And one of the questions the investor is going to be is, well, do they put some more money in optimistically on the basis that the business will grow? Or are they putting good money after bad? And this is a very difficult question. And many investors get stuck with a business they really don't want to be in. It's not growing as quickly as they want. They've got money in there. Should they put more money in? It's quite a difficult question to answer. But an attractive business plan will show rapid growth, good financial returns, and ideally you'll be able to address in some detail how an exit might work. So for example, you might say, oh, I know somebody who's active in this area, a business who would be complimentary, and they have a record of making acquisitions to build their business. Now that starts to sound like a very reasonable route to exit. So here we are, four considerations for investors. The management team, that is you and the people you're going to recruit, how you're going to manage the money, and then thirdly is the technology and the intellectual property. So really, it can't be stressed enough how important you are as the management team or the representative of the management team at this point. Finance will be a big question because, as I've discussed, it's a financial transaction you're getting into. Most often, the investors aren't getting into the business that you have because they love the technology. They're doing it for a financial return. And they'll also want to understand something about the markets and competitors. A bit of an overview of what the situation is like for people who are looking for investment. And this has been my experience over probably 10 years. I've been making private sector investments or supporting them. And that is there's much more money available than there is good fundable propositions. So if you've got an experienced management team with a credible business plan and a realistic valuation, there's a very good chance that you'll be able to attract funds into your business. And how are you going to attract funds into your business? Well, that's by pitching. I'm going to pass you over to Kevin now, who's going to discuss the whole question of pitching in some more detail. So you're going to be spending time if you get the enterprise fellowship uh, practicing pitching learning how to pitch but before that you've got to do your first pitch for business funding which will be the RSE panel what the RSE panel have said to Tony and myself is our preference is that lots of people who do the application forms will get the opportunity to pitch to us um, unless the application form uh, is terrible or has something absolutely disqualifying, and an example would be they haven't secured their intellectual property, we do want to hear them. But you've then got to make an efficient pitch, and you don't have a lot of time to do that. So, as Tony has already uh, suggested, avoid talking too much about your technology. One of the things we have heard is that Oh yeah, we asked them a simple question about their technology. We had 15 minutes for questions and they took 10 minutes to answer one question. Don't do that. Keep your answers short and to the point. And it's quite acceptable that there may be a technology enthusiast on the panel who gets very excited when you discuss your technology. It's quite all right to gently deflect them and say, if you don't mind, I'll give the short answer now but I'm very happy to talk about the, the details of the technology offline. The next thing you have to do is to acknowledge what it is that you don't know, right? Um, one of the things that investors immediately detect is someone who is bluffing. If you don't know stuff, tell them that you don't know. Now, what the RSC have suggested that you cover in your presentation is please include the following points if possible. You and your background, briefly, your technology, the product, the markets that you plan to target, any potential customers identified, any competitors identified, your business model, the IP position, and your role in the company and others in the team. That's actually quite a lot to cover um, in the short time that you have allowed for the presentation. 
That's quite a lot of things. And there's a danger that those points don't hang together. When I coach people, which is quite frequently to do presentations in this area, I suggest that they try to tell a story that builds from one slide to the next. So your presentation as a story, how would that go? It would be like this. Slide one, someone somewhere in the world has an important problem. We can't detect tumors from cancers that are deep inside the body. How many people, how big a problem? Well, actually this affects hundreds of thousands of people every year and there are several million people affected in the UK alone. Slides two or three, we've been clever. It's not obvious, but we have a piece of technology that could solve the problems and specifically say, here is our invention and this invention brings benefits to these people. Link the technology with the helping the people. Then identify who gets the benefit. In the case of a medical device, who are the real beneficiaries of this? It could be the patients, yeah. There could be some customers out there. It could be the managers in the hospital because they will save money. Yes. In the case of the invention of the transistor, it was clear that young people, teenage music fans, were getting what was to them a life-changing benefit of being able to listen to their own choice of music inexpensively. But you have to pin down who gets the benefit. For those of you working on environmental projects, there's a potential trap here, which is the people that get the benefit in the form of reduced pollution aren't always the people that and have to pay for it. The company who uh, has controls imposed on them. And again, you'd have to identify that. In this slide as well, you have to say something around your technology, which is how good does our technology have to be to deliver these benefits? How big are the tumors that we're looking uh, to spot on someone's pancreas? Is it two millimeters? Is it five millimeters? Identify that. And then move on to slide three and four would be our product in the market. What do we think our business model would, would be? At the moment, it's going to change, but at the moment, what's a, what do we expect our business model might be? Tony and I, when we talk to uh, aspiring investor, inventors, uh, ask them a question along, along these lines. Who's your first invoice going to be to? And on that invoice, what is it going to say that you have done to deserve getting paid? Um, that's that's uh, the business model. And you need to be mentioning the business model in your presentation, even if you don't know exactly what it's going to be. Very important is some comments from other people. Some comments from people that you have specifically interviewed or spoken to uh, comments from stakeholders in the industry, for example, if it is a cancer treatment or cancer diagnostic, then you would get that information from an oncologist. We think this is a great idea. Put that in there. Put something in there about competitors. And remember, competitors are people who deliver the same benefit as you, not those who use the same technology as you. So anyone that can detect uh, cancers deeply inside the body, whether they're using ultrasound or CT scans, or whether they just have a highly trained sniffer dog, those are all your competitors. From there, it's fairly straightforward. People can understand when you start to discuss your intellectual property. We think we need to patent this, not just in the UK, which is about 10% of the world market for um, medical devices, but we need to patent this in the United States, which is actually about 40% of the world market for, um, for devices. The, the logic flows from one slide to another. Slide six or seven, you need to address why me? You need to address what I can do for this, what my skills are. 
And even more so, you need to address and specifically, here are the things that I know I don't know. Here are the things where I know I need help. This is why I need the fellowship. You're getting quite a large amount of what is largely public money and you have to be able to justify why you. What I think I need to make this happen. And what will happen, I've suggested you do this in six or seven slides. What will almost certainly happen is that you will actually write about nine or 10 or 12 or 15 slides, which all look brilliant and cogent for you. Um, don't waste them, just put them into a frequently asked uh, questions. So finish, finish the presentation, say any questions, FAQ, and have all the other slides in, um, in reserve. And secondly, as we have already uh, intimated, there will be a panel of people interviewing you. Give them, if you can, all a chance to ask a question. In other words, you have to answer questions briefly and succinctly. You might like to practice this with questions that you can anticipate. And especially don't get drawn into discussing technical issues at great lengths. And if you can do all that, then your very best of luck and you stand a good chance of, of being able to receive one of the fellowship awards. There's a nice um, comment that, I, I, that someone said here. Um, Identify what you don't know. Be like Socrates not Donald Rumsfeld. If you remember, Socrates was the man who said, the wisest man is the man who knows how little he knows. Donald Rumsfeld was the man who said, when we invaded Iraq, what really got us were the unknown unknowns, the things that we didn't know that we didn't know. So specifically try to identify what it is you don't know. As I mentioned in the last slide, identify why you need the fellowship. It's not just to stay alive for a year. That means you should be taking it very seriously as well. There is something over a hundred thousand pounds of public money goes into supporting each fellow um, in the course of the year. Recognize that it's competitive. And finally, are you personally ready? We have said in earlier videos that you have 12 months to produce a fundable plan. What we would suggest is that at the end of 12 months, you shouldn't just have a fundable plan, but you should have a funded plan. You need to, go, to be able to go fairly smoothly from uh, the Enterprise Fellowship, hopefully into a funded situation where you are starting on growing your company. So let's summarize what we've discussed in this presentation. We've talked about, firstly, what it is that investors look for in high growth startups. Secondly, we've talked about what it is you need to say in your presentation when asking investors in general for money, and specifically when it comes to the Enterprise Fellowship presentation. That's the end of this presentation. Uh, Good luck with your application form and your presentation, and we look forward to hearing that you've been successful in your application to the Enterprise Fellowship Programme. If you want further information, you should take those questions directly to the RSE, who will be able to answer your questions. Thanks very much for your attention.